Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of Straight Talk Whiskey. This is episode number 34, and I'm Nick, here with you as always. Um, and so today, we've decided to head back to um, the Scotch Whiskies, and we have a, a lovely one for you today. We have Tomatin, 12-year-old. Um, it's a Highland single malt Scotch. So, where do we start? Well, Tomatin has a pretty, pretty long and pretty rich history. Now, it, it most definitely, the distillery goes back to about 1897, um, when they were producing whiskey for sure, but, um, as with a lot of other distilleries, um, one might think that their history actually stretched back to the 16th, 15th century, um, which was mostly, you know, the illicit, um, distilling of spirit whiskey back then. So, it's not really proven, but, um, you know, a lot of people like to think that it goes back that lately. And largely, the success of, um, Tomatin, um, really led to the creation of the town nearby of the namesake. And so, Tomatin has a really interesting, um, sort of history behind it. Now, they have a, a couple variations of this. Um, I think they own uh, a few other things. The Kubla Khan um, is another one that they own. But it's just interesting to note when I was looking this up that 80% um, actually of its employees still live on or near the site of Tomatin, which I thought was interesting. It really kind of gives it the, um, the family family brand name there, not just um, family as in keeping it um, with one set of owners. Not, that's not the case here, but what I mean is sort of just this, uh, you know, closeness of its employees to the job, um, which is interesting. Um, the box, um, that's a nice little box, nothing wrong with it. Um, let's see, uh, it's matured for 12, or, oh, over 12 years, actually. Um, but we know that with the age statement on it, the youngest whiskey in this bottle is 12 years old. Could be some 25, 20 year old in it, but you know, the minimum age um, to be called a 12 year old single malt scotch, single malt scotch whiskey is 12 years here. So, and it is a, a Highland single malt. And what else about it? It's, uh, we kick it a step up a little bit like we've been asking for. Um, 43% ABV, so that's, that's a nice little addition there. And, um, yeah, so let's get into it. We'll pour a little bit. Excellent, there we go. So, you see that nice, sort of palish, sort of cloudy-ish, um, really faint hint honey of gold in there which makes me think, hmm, maybe they didn't chill filter it as much, or maybe they didn't add any caramel to it. Why? Because who needs it? Um, if it's good, that's all we care about. We don't care that we see little particles in there where we might add a drop of water in there and we might get scared. No. Okay. So yeah, like I was saying, if you do add some water to this, um, 43%, maybe you could add a little bit and see what changes. Like I said last week, a uh, minute in the cast, minute in the glass sort of thing. So you could let this one sit out a little bit and see what changes. Um, always fun to experiment that way. Um, but anyway, getting back to the age, you can so definitely see um, when you roll it around in the glass, you start to get the legs forming on, on the glass. Now you probably can't see it on here. Um, we could probably, if you have um, an older whiskey or the Tomatin, um, which is it's pretty fairly easy to get, um, you'll start to see sort of the, the spear of the legs clinging to the bottle, such as you would if you were um, a wine connoisseur or something like that. You might take a look at, at the legs almost uh, trickling down slowly back into the glass, which makes you think that it's uh, been aged for a little bit um, longer, if you don't know the age statement exactly. But, you know, we know it's a 12-year, so we definitely, that's just another kind of uh, test to back it up. So, um, let's go into the nose. Hmm. Now, this one, this one is definitely a light, 
um, flavorful, um, just bright um, whiskey. It's not um, not peated um, at all, at least from what I can tell and from any of the research. I do believe that they do put out a uh, peated version of whiskey um, under a different name. Um, but yeah, there's that. Still produced, but distilled rather by Taman. But what you get here is sort of interesting um, fruity flavors going on in here. Sort of uh, mango. Um, there's a little hint of cantaloupe going on in there. Grapefruit is definitely a big um, component in the nose. But also sort of this subtle, um, and actually it's not that subtle, but it's sort of kind of uh, lying, lying low here, is um, a raisin sort of note going on, which is really interesting. Um, white grapes, definitely. Still a little bit of astringency to it. Um, a little acidity that you can get kind of peaks at uh, the tip of your nose there. But also a nice, nice bakery note. Fresh, uh, fresh malt um, going on in there. Really wonderful, great character, and um, this is a this is a fine example of a nice uh, independent um, distillery here. Um, yes, they're owned by um, a Japanese corporation, I believe. But what you have here is something really nice, really uh, forward. Um, you know, it is what it is. It ain't trying to dumb down and water down and be something it's not, but. Sort of lemony characteristics going on in there too, which is really interesting. So let's go in for the taste. Mm. Definitely that lovely grapefruit going on in there. So interesting to see. Like I said before, you can have, you could probably put five different Highland or um, Speyside scotches next to each other and get something completely different every time. Um, uh, this is why I really do like the, the Highland um, single malts because you do have sort of this um, contrast in character um, of whiskeys compared to um, like the Isla um, single malts and, and other Scotch whiskeys that you know have the heavily peatedness. They take up a lot of uh, notes from the seaside and that sort of things. Um, sea salt is definitely a big one. You get sort of the, the grassy notes. But here, what we have, and this is this is helpful in a way because Tamatan is it's up pretty high in elevation, over a thousand feet um, above sea level. Sea level, I believe. I don't know what that. I forget what that translates to into meters. Um, you know, not that it really matters, but um, you know, it's high up there, so. They definitely always talk about the water sources up higher being a little bit um, fresher and that sort of thing, which is which is definitely interesting. And you you wonder about these um, specific aspects like the water, the type where the grains are sourced. Um, are they genetically modified? We don't don't want that at all. But um, you think of all these little different things, distilling processes, different cuts the master distiller might make. Um, if you're working with blends, type of things are blending it with. Maturation. Now, this would be aged, um, should be aged, and I'm not entirely sure because um, I couldn't find this anywhere, but it's aged in um, bourbon casks, but finished in um, X sherry butts. So you do have that sort of note, um, and it's definitely, it's not like I go in and I'm like, <whistles> cherry. That's not totally what you get. I mean, there's definitely that the fruitiness to it. Um, but it's not specifically like a sherry wine that you might think. Now you might smell different. You might right off the bat um, sense sherry, but I, um, that's not the first thing that I gravitated towards, but was more of the, the grapefruit, um, mango, that kind of thing. Those really vibrant, um, more tropical type fruits that really have this nice ripe, um, um, not pungent, but really, really effective, really... Um, powerful um, scent to them, which comes through in the taste, which is great. It's a beautiful balance. Full-bodied, well-balanced, long finish, 
great development going on in there. You start with these fruitier flavors, but then it kind of morphs, it transforms, and what you get is the maltier characteristic to it, this fresh, fresh uh, baked bread. From that, if you went to a bakery, you know, right at 5, 6 in the morning, that's sort of what you would get. Um, you got this nice, fresh sense going on in there, um, nice, fresh malt. It's wonderful. You got, and then you get a slight hint, slight, uh, slight kick there in spice. Um, definitely helps with the, the higher ABV because you get sort of nice, um, nice little oomph behind it, and you don't feel like it leaves leaves you too quick. This is really a good whiskey. If you want to take your um, nosing and tasting um, experience and, and sensing to the next level, you know, if you're just just starting out, this would be a great scotch to go to. Some people are like, oh, it's scotch. Like, I can't handle that. And they think of, like, Lafroy um, and that sort of Lagavulin, um, things like that, where they think scotch and they think, oh, it's got to have this heavy uh, peat to it. That's not the case. Um, you have various regions of Scotch whiskey, and, um, and certainly you can get into that, into the more peatier things, but I wouldn't suggest going right for the Lafroy, um, because that might be a little bit jarring, and you might be deterred from trying something like that again. So, um, start nice and smooth, ease into it. Um, we reviewed Beaumont Small Batch a while back, that's a good, nicely, lightly peated whiskey to, to get into the peatiness. Um, I don't want to get way off topic into peat, but just, um, just in terms of talking about Tamatin as a nice example of a Highland uh, single malt of which you can get um, yourself into tasting and smelling different things. And keep a list too. You know, it's helpful if you can be like, yeah, I do, I do smell some fresh, uh, bright white grapes in there. I do smell um, some mango, that sort of thing. Um, a little bit of malt characteristic, honey. Touch of lemon in there going on. And some other things. You may notice some spices in there. You know, your nose is different than mine, and your palate is different than mine. Totally, perfectly fine. Um, it's all about what you can sense, um, you know, based on... You know, you got to trust your nose, um, trust your palate. Um, you'll develop it. You, you can't expect to know um, all all the different types of um, spices that you might get or nuts or different um, flavors and that sort of thing because you haven't smelled it yet. This is why sometimes, because I don't claim to be an expert, like I said in the last review, but um, so a lot of times I attribute what I smell to... Um, experiences, that sort of thing, like a campfire. Well, you can't taste a campfire, but you know that it smells um, fire, the burning wood, marshmallows, that sort of thing, um, chocolate you can get in there, um, graham cracker, that's another one that does come through in some bourbons and even some scotches that I've had. You definitely get a little bit of that note. Um, the toast of Willer, I said, um, it's charcoal sort of note. Um, heavy, heavy smoke going on in there. So you can take these sort of experiences that aren't really like, um, in and of itself, taste or, yeah, really taste experiences. You know, you're not going to go and, you can't go lick the campfire, folks. Don't do it. Okay? You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> that's ridiculous. So, yeah, just kind of, you know, attributing to things like that. Sort of like the bakery. You know, that's a smell sort of thing. It's not, um, and you know what I mean. You can go and taste certain things, but it's just the, um, it's the experience. It's walking on the boardwalk um, by the sea, you know, smelling the, the sea spray, that sort of thing. It's all these types of experience, which are helpful. Some people, in their opinion, they don't think it's helpful, right? But, um, you know, to me it is, and that's the way I'm going to keep it. And if they don't like it, they don't like it. And I'm going to do me. So... Let's go in for one last taste, make sure we didn't get anything uh, left out here. Mm. 
still as lovely as ever. And um, I might be a little interested to see what happens if I leave this out for a little while. So I may, um, I may set a little bit aside sometime. You can do the same and see if anything changes. Um, there's always, always a chance that um, it'll take a positive sort of spin. Um, it won't necessarily lack flavor. Sure, if you leave it overnight um, for too long or... You know, I want to suggest doing that because you might get something that's really kind of dumbed down in flavor. But just give it a few minutes. Um, some things can take an hour. Um, check your ABV on what you're drinking to. If you've got a high ABV, like we did the the old Granddad 114 proof, you can't you can't expect to just go in and take that downtown. But you know, just let it sit out, let it smooth out. Um, compare, contrast, make notes, note the changes, that sort of thing. So it's all about becoming more learned and, um, you know, and you become more enthusiastic about it because you can compare and contrast and you can, you sort of, you start to build um, a list of certain things that you like. So when new things come out, you can be like, oh, well, um, that's sort of similar to, you know, such and such that you like. Um, so you might be interested in purchasing that and you might, um, you might just help somebody out that is, you know, looking for somebody for advice um, on what to buy next. So, um, in light of all that, I thank you very much for joining me on Whiskey Review number 34. And I'm very anxious to, uh, to do another review and see you again and, and get all your comments, which I love. Um, I think it's awesome. So, keep that up. Have a great rest of the week. And um, as always, drink responsibly, and we'll see you next time.